the actual mappings and we're creating the mappings, the Hibernian mappings for our project Timex. Now it's time to make it run and see if it works. Before we do that, we're going to have to create a package inside our source. And this new package, we're going to call it the com Timex Web Util. And this package will hold a Java class that we're going to need. We're going to call it the Hibernate Util. It's sort of like the class that it's going to allow us to load the Hibernate framework inside our project and use it inside any of our classes. <coughs> so this class basically looks something like this. We call it a Hibernate Util, but it's going to be a singleton class. What is a singleton? Singleton is one of the most common, well-known design patterns in Java. And it's basically in in its essence is a class that will be created once and only once and that's what we want to be able to do with Hibernate. We do not want to have different sessions of Hibernate within our project. We want only one session that will handle everything that is related to the database. Whether it uses two connections or a hundred connections, I don't care but we need to have one session within our project that will handle our database connections. And the only way we can really enforce that uniqueness is if we create a Java class called a singleton. And a singleton is the design pattern that allows us to create one and only one instance of a class. How do we implement a singleton in Java? this is how you do it. This is how we do it. We declare a static section in the class. And the static section session will be executed the first time that you load the class in, in, the, virtu in the Java Virtual Machine. What does it do? It tries to do the following. It tries to create a new configuration, and this is one of the Hibernate classes. It's called the configuration. And guess what? This class, all it does is it goes into the XML that we created, the XML that says hey, it's going to be a MySQL database, it's going to be called Timex, it's going to be root, no password, blah, 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 and it's going to load it. Okay? New configuration, then we're going to execute the configure method of that class and then it's going to build the session factory. The session factory is going to be the session that we the entire project here is going to be using and we're going to put it in a variable called our session factory, this guy. If there's any problems with the database or the configuration it's going to throw an exception and it's going to say huh! There was an initial session factor creation problem. And it would just throw that exception. That's it. And it will be done the first time that it loads that class. What happens when anybody in the project asks for the session factory? It's going to call, hey, get me the session factory. Hibernate Util, get me the session factory. What is it going to do? it's going to return that one and only one session factory variable. So you know, by doing it this way, you know you're guaranteed you will always get back the same object, the same session, because it will be created only once and not anymore. So as you can see, first of all, this class doesn't have a constructor. 
Do we have a, fu a method called hibernate util? No, we don't. It does not have a constructor. And in fact, it has a static section, which is the piece of code that lo that runs first before anything else. And it, what it does, it creates an instance of the session factor. That's what we want. We want to be able to create one and only one session factor in our project. Okay. So given that, we're going to create our first Hibernate test. And to do that, let's create a new package. We want to keep things separate. You know, we want the domain separate from the utility classes, separate from the test classes, separate from later on we're going to see something called the controllers, separate from the views. I mean, we're going to we want to keep everything separate so that we have all the concerns in a separate place. We're going to call it the com timex web test package. Inside here, we're going to create our hibernate test class. And we're running out of time right now, so I'm just going to copy it directly from the author's source code. And I want you to do, this is what you guys are going to be doing for next week, by the way. You guys are going to be creating your Hibernate mappings, you're going to be creating your Hibernate configuration, and you're going to be creating your Hibernate test. Okay? And the test is very simple. Very simple. It's just a class that has a main simple as that. I mean, this is CSIS uh, 2100 or 3100, Programming 2, Java. We're going to call it Hibernate Test Class, and it has a public static void main. You guys are familiar with this. This is the well-known point of entry of any Java project, which means we can execute our Hibernate Test Class independent of the rest of the classes in our project. What do we do here? This is what we're going to do here. First of all, we're going to create our own session factory. Okay? And the reason why we're not going to use the hybrid and util session factory is because we want to be able to test, independent from our project, we will be able to test whether our mappings are working with the database and our models. This is just a test, plain test. So the same stuff that we put in the Hibernate Util, we're going to do it here. We say, okay, new configuration, and and if and if you guys copy this, you you will see that like configuration comes from the Hibernate transaction comes from the Hibernate session factor. All this stuff comes from the Hibernate jar that it's part of the uh, dependencies of the project. So we're going to create the new configuration, configure build session factor. We're going to save it here. Sort of like the same stuff the Hibernate Util does for us. And then what do we do? We say, OK, let's open the session. And this is what typically you will do when you start building your project uh, with controllers and managers and all that stuff. We're going to see later on how that's done. You pretty much open a session because you're about to do a transaction with the database and you save that in the session variable. And then you say, okay, we're about to start the transaction. So you tell the session, begin transaction. Okay? And you are given back a transaction object. Whatever you do with the database, queries, updates, inserts, etc., etc., will not be saved in the database, will not be committed on the database until you tell this guy, the transaction guy, hey, commit. So everything will happen in memory. And only until you say, hey, transaction commit, the whole thing will be put in the database. Absolutely all the code that you execute between the beginning and the commit will not be in the database. Okay, and that's something important to remember. What am I going to do here? I'm going to declare a variable called department. 
Yeah, it's one of the my domain classes. And look at this. I'm going to say, hey, session, I want you to get me all the departments, and departments I mean from the class department, that you can get me from the IT table. I'm sorry, all the departments that the primary key is equal to IT. I read that wrong, sorry. <laughs> So basically, you're telling, hey, session, I want you to get me all the departments whose primary key is IT. Notice that I have never indicated select star from department where department code equals IT. Never have I done anything like that. So the session will translate, oh, okay, you want me to create this type of classes, objects of this type of class, go into the database and somehow I'm going to find out what is the dissociated table to it and I'm going to find out what's the primary key to, of, of it and I'm going to match values in that primary key to this value and I'm going to be creating an object and I'm going to be giving it to you. And when you come back I want you to, the objects that you create, I want you to cast them to the department and save it right here. What am I going to do with it? I'm just going to say, hey, department.getName. Remember one of our getters in the department? Get name. You guys want to see that working? Let's debug it step by step. Do we have to debug it on the server? No. This is a class that has a main. So it could be a Java application type of class. It can be executed as a Java application, in other words. So we're going to de debug it as a Java application. Oops, I should have put a, start, a stop there. Yes, but we want to execute the main. If we execute it on the server, it will not execute the main. Man, I didn't. Stop! Ugh. All right, sorry, I, I forgot to put a breakpoint there. And so it ran the whole thing. So let's run it again. Debug. Yeah, it works. <laughs> but <laughs> I wanted to show you how it works. <laughs> so, since I'm debugging it, it will switch automatically to the debug perspective. And this is it. Look at this. I'm about to create the session factory, so I create the session factory. Notice what it does behind the scenes. It's actually going and finding the Configure the hibernate configuration so it knows exactly what kind of database it's going to communicate to, what, what credentials it needs, what table, what uh, database it's going to be at, and all that stuff. Right? Then you're going to tell to open the session. There you got the session. Then you create a transaction. There it is. And here it is. Here's the session factory, and you guys can look at all the stuff that is in there, uh, you know, all the, uh, the name SQL all that stuff that it's associated to the session factory as well as the session and then look at this the this is where you tell the session hey get me a department with key IT and we're going to execute it notice what happens behind the scenes remember we said in the configuration I want to see the SQL SQL show equals true here it is hibernate is creating a select department code as this thing, department name as that thing, from department where department zero equals question mark. That was a query generated by Hibernate. Okay? And that's the query that gets executed behind the scenes against the database. Once it comes back, it creates an object of it. 
and we cast it into a department. So if we take a look at our department, look at this. Department code, IT. Name, information technology. In fact, that's exactly what we have in here. Department IT is information technology. It created an object, Java object, out of a record in the department table. So that's what gives us the freedom of doing, hey, let's print out name of IT equals department that get name. Here it is, name of IT equals information technology. Did you guys see the power of Hibernate? You want to be able to take a look at the SQL table. Okay, here is the SQL table. Yes, IT is a parameter. Yes. Ah, uh -huh. when you tell the session to get, and you're passing the actual class that you want to get back, Hibernate is going to go and investigate what that class is associated to in the database. And it's going to find a Hibernate mapping that says, hey, there's a Hibernate mapping called department Hibernate mapping. And it has a key, and the key is department code. And what this guy wants me to do is actually go and find one that is equal to IT. Grab it, create a department object out of it, and give it back. And figure all that out with just saying, hello, you know what, session, get me. Now, is that the only function there is? No. Look at this. Look at all the different functions that the session has available for you. Get, load, merge, create criteria, create filters, create a query, disconnect, enable filters, get class, get entity mode, get flush, get session. Is it dirty? Is it open? Look at all that stuff. Flush it. Refresh, replicate, save or update. You can do all that stuff in the session. Typically, those are functions at a high level that you do against the database with a whole bunch of queries. Insert, update, um, select, delete. All that stuff that you know you can do with SQL are all encapsulated into functions of the se Hibernate session. And you don't have to deal at all with SQL or tables or relational database management systems. You deal with objects. Okay? Let's take a look at another one. This one, for instance, this one, what it does, it's we're going to try to get a list, a whole list of them. Notice that this past one was just one, right? Hey, session, create a query. And look what the query looks like. You just pass a string. And the query is from department. That's it. So this is the equivalent saying, Select star from department. In other words, give me all the departments. Once you give it back, I want you to return it as a list. And you're going to save it in here, the department list. What are you going to do with it? You're going to loop through it. And each one that you get in the list, it's an object. In fact, you're giving back a list of objects, but you know what those objects are, because you know what the query is for. You know that there are departments, so you cast them into departments, and you save it here. And then what do you do with it? 
you just get the name or get the department code and do whatever you want with it. In this case, what we're doing is we're printing on in a row. So look at this. This is what we're going to do. Whoa, look at what Hibernate did. The query behind the scene. Select department code as whatever, department name as whatever from department. That was the query behind the scenes. And it came back with a whole list. And then what do you do with that list? Row 1, accounting is AC. Row 2, customer support, CS. These are all the different departments. I'm sorry? What if you just wanted to select specific one or maybe you want... All right. Right, right. There is a way of just selecting a few or a certain criteria and you don't have to specify um, um, a query. In fact, you can create filters you can specify something like, for instance, um, let me see, I think you can do something like this, where um, department code, um, where department code, I think there's a way of specifying that it's in, um, a certain criteria like NAC or CS or HR or whatever. Um, you know what? There's a way. Let me get. Let me finish this first, and then we'll go into a much more complex uh, test. And then at the end, you just commit your transaction, which in this case we haven't done really any updates or anything like that. But uh, we don't want to be holding those connections, so by committing the transaction and closing the session you're releasing all the resources and then closing the session factory and that's typically what you have to do for every single test um, and that's it you're done with the your, your hibernate test okay so now that you're familiar with the JUnit framework and what it does for you the idea is to be able to create JUnit tests for your Hibernate mappings. So what I want you to do for next week is I want you to create your Hibernate test. Okay? I want you to test every single table that you have in your database. In this case, we just tested the department table, okay? But well, we could have tested um, the other two, the employee and the um, and the timesheet. In fact, if I have enough time, I'll I'll do that out there. just to see that you're actually going to the database and Hibernate is pulling up all the information. Believe me, if there's some problem with the way you name the fields or something in your Hibernate mappings that does not work, Hibernate will let you know. So I want to make sure that you guys can actually pull data out of the database through Hibernate. Okay? That's going to be key for what we're going to be covering next week. Next week we're going to be covering managers and controllers. And we're going to be doing our first functional requirement, the implementation of our first functional requirement. Okay? So we need to have this database object relational mapper working. Okay? So you're going to got you guys going to do the hibernate mappings, the hibernate configuration, the hibernate test. to every single table in your database on yourself to provide parameters to it okay so let's very quickly let's create a, a third demo
we know that we're going to have to use that. Okay? What else do we know? We know we're going to have to get a list of timesheets. Right? We know that our object is called timesheet, correct? And we want to be able to provide the code. Okay? We know that it's called status code because if we go into our timesheet, oops. we go into our timesheet oh, in fact it's called department code right T department code oh no it's the status I'm sorry it's the status that we're looking for status code here it is status code where status code equals question mark. And you know that we're going to get a list, whether it's an empty list, meaning there's none, or a whole bunch of them. We want a list. Okay? We want a list. What else? Now, since we are passing a parameter, okay, since we're passing a parameter, we're going to have to specify where that parameter comes from. So that parameter is going to come from this variable that we're going to create here. And notice that it's going to be a character. Sorry. That's weird. Oh, no wonder. Sorry. P is a character, not a string. <laughs> right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to tell a session to create a query, and the query is going to be from timesheet word status code, and this status code is the status code name inside the timesheet class equals question mark. And you're going to have, by specifying a question mark, you're going to uh, have the freedom of setting a string, setting a date, setting a time, setting whatever. In this case, it's setting a character for the first parameter which means you can have more than one parameter in your query. And you can set a character for the first one and set a string for the second one and set a number for the third one, etc. as many parameters as you need. So Hibernate is going to parse this query from left to right and the first question mark is going to be the sub-0. The second question mark is going to be sub-1. Here it is. Okay, so the sub zero referring to this, which is the only one, you're going to set that as a character, and the character is going to come from test code, status code, and you're going to get back a list. Yes, hold on. Let me execute this before you ask the question. Let's debug this job application. Let's jump all the way down here. 
execute run to line. There it is. There you go. So now we have status code equals P. There you go, here's status code equals P. Then we're going to create the query and tell it the session to execute it. Come back with the list. Look what it created. Where employee ID equals, oops, question mark. I think we did the wrong query. <laughs> right? Employee ID equals. Let's see what it came back with. Timesheet list. Yeah, size 2. I don't even know how many. How many timesheets are pending in the database? Oh, yeah, 2. Timesheet ID 1 and timesheet ID 3. So the size equals 2. You want to see it? Look at the element data. Sub 0 and sub 1. If we take a look at the sub 0, it is a timesheet. In fact, look at this. Employee ID 2, blah, blah, blah. Timesheet ID 1. Department code is IT. But better yet, remember we told it not to be lazy when it loaded the timesheet? Look at this. It created a department object that if you expand, you will see that it has the department code and the department name. And he created an employee object. They're all part of the timesheet object. An employee object that says email is a Kumar, employee code age, the name is Ajay Kumar, his password, everything associated to the timesheet. Okay? Now, what was confusing to me was the actual Hibernate query that Hibernate created. Right? Because it talks about employee ID equals question mark. That's weird. Because notice that what I'm actually doing is I'm uncomparing it to the status code. So that's how you will do something like that. Give me all the pending timesheets. This is it. You will create this query. Now, is that the only way to do it? No. You could have just created a filter and say, hey, from timesheet. And you will grab to you, it will give you all the timesheets, but before it gives it to you, it will run through the filter. And the filter says, hmm, I just want the status code equals P. So it will filter all those and it will only give you the ones that you want. Now, what's the beauty of it? You don't have to deal with a database. You do not have to deal with SQL statements. You're giving objects. In fact, you're given all the objects and their related other objects all together. What's the drawback? What do you guys think is going to be the drawback? And it's almost like in the same line of what you were bringing up. I just want the timesheet IDs. I don't want the whole timesheet speed. It's going to be a lot of work on the database management system because it's grabbing absolutely everything and creating objects out of them. You do not just want a list of timesheets. When you say, I want a timesheet, it's going to bring the entire timesheet and give you a whole list and create every single field that a timesheet holds. Yes, yes. In the hybrid mapping, you can say lazy true. Yes, 
good point. Sometimes you want to you want the data hibernate to be lazy about it, which means you will not get that department and employee for that timesheet right away. Only if you ask for it, then you will get that query, which will delay a little bit the whole. Are there any questions? So be prepared because next week we're going to build, we're going to actually implement our first functional requirement. So next week we're going to be including Spring, which is our MVC pattern implementation in Java. We're going to make Spring work together with Hibernate. And we're going to create our first controller. And that controller is the one that is going to provide us our home page timesheet list. In other words, I just logged in. It's me. I want you to give me all my and only my timesheets.